What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. I am Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. We're wrapping up the sleepers today. We did wide receivers last week or earlier this week. We did running backs the week prior, so I'll link both of them down below. Today, we're going to jump into quarterbacks and tight ends. I know nobody likes talking about either of them, but it's got to be done. Someone's got to do it. When the public zigs, we zag over here, so we get into the muck. If you enjoy the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe if you are a new viewer. We're going to be bringing you quality content like this all summer as well as into the season. I'll tell you what, I'm pumped up for today's episode. For one reason, because I finally figured out how to edit out the fan in my background in post-production. So I'm not going to be sweating my cook off the entire time. That being said, I've never done this before, so it might actually not work at all. And you might be hearing a fan in the background the entire time. So I apologize for that. Work with me. It's like 98 degrees here in New York. Shit is real in the summer, but I love the summer. I just copped a new drone. I got the Mavic 2 Zoom. So there's going to be some premium vlog content in the coming weeks. But we're here today to talk about fantasy football, top sleepers for 2019 fantasy football, quarterbacks and tight ends. Let's get it. Real quick, before we dive in, uh, I kind of been going through something and I wanted to see if anybody out there could help. And by going through something, I mean I burnt the shit out of my arm the other day when I was cooking. And some of the oil splattered onto me. They're blistering up a little bit. And I've just been throwing Aquaphor on it, which is probably really dumb. But, like, that's what you put on tattoos just because it keeps the skin moisturized. And I feel like Aquaphor is the overall, it's like the god skin cream. Just throw it on and it kind of fixes everything. But there's definitely, like, a more normal way to help these blisters heal. So if anyone's ever been burned before... I'm not talking about by like fucking Derrick Henry or Leonard Fournette last year. I'm talking about real life burns. Please let me know what I should be putting on this because uh, I don't want them to scar. If I'm going to scar the skin on my arms, I would rather do it with ridiculous tattoos like the one that says, don't take Derrick Henry. Let's jump into the first quarterback on the list. We have my man Lamar Jackson. An extremely interesting case for fantasy football. He's a polarizing player at this point because we don't see a lot of quarterbacks come in with his rushing upside. We see a lot of athletic quarterbacks. We see mobile quarterbacks, but not ones who are competing with the, the top running back on the list on their depth chart. So where do we start with Lamar Jackson? The good, the bad, the ugly. Let's let's start with the latter two to get those out of the way and we could uh, leave you with a positive takeaway for the Ravens starting running back. I mean quarterback. To say that Lamar Jackson was bad throwing the ball in 2018 would be like saying... I only park my car illegally sometimes. I literally cannot stop getting parking tickets. It's becoming a very large burden on my life. And it just, it just ain't true. The Ravens quarterback, after taking over starting duties in week 11, held pro football focus PFF's third worst passing grade among 35 qualified quarterbacks. Josh Allen was the only starting quarterback who rated out lower on the list. Yaxon ranked 38th in adjusted completion percentage. Again, only Josh Allen ranked lower. Lamar's deep ball accuracy rate of 38.5% ranked 23rd amongst NFL quarterbacks and his accuracy was dead last on throws when he was in a clean pocket. Admittedly, he is on the sleeper list, but that last stat, just how poorly he ranked when throwing out of a clean pocket makes me nervous as his prospect of being a starting quarterback. I mean, there were times last year when we had Willie Sneed, the god, running crispy routes over the middle, and Lamar Jackson would cock his arm back, sling the thing, and it would be a yard and a half backwards and behind his head. And you're like, oh, no, baby, what is you doing? By all intents and purposes, Lamar Jackson was bad at throwing the ball. But the, the slogan for the summer is context, right? Everything's got to be put into context. And I have plenty of it for you here about Lamar Jackson. Last year, Lamar Jackson took over, as I mentioned, as a starting quarterback in week 11. They threw an unpolished, raw, completely raw quarterback in Lamar Jackson into their starting quarterback role midway through the season. I expected him to struggle. I expected him to put up great rushing production, which exactly is what he did. But I expected him to struggle through the air. What I love about what they're doing in Baltimore is they're completely building 
building around him. And you don't see a lot of NFL teams really buy into a system or buy into a player, but they've done that with Lamar Jackson. They have, one, used first round draft capital on him. So with that, you're pretty much putting yourself into a three to four year window to see what you go all in on that quarterback. You draft the guy in the first round, you're going all in on him, at least for the entirety of his rookie contract. And we see it with every quarterback, right? You want to at least see that rookie contract out to see if the potential, a lot of the times first round picks are made first round picks only because of the the hype and the upside of the guy. But you want to see that through in case they do end up hitting that ceiling. But when we look at this offense, man, this is a complicated offense. Tons of play action, RPOs, run pass options, weapons moving around pre-snap. You cannot simply make this switch halfway through, especially with the lack of speed that they had on offense last year. Make this switch with all this, the complications around in the middle of a bye week and expect Lamar Jackson and this offense to just run as, as perfectly as you would like it to from a statistical standpoint. As soon as Lamar Jackson got onto the field last year, defenses had one thing on their mind, and it was to zone in on Lamar Jackson and try to stop him. Their weapons group was bottom five in the NFL last year. They had no one to throw to. They had a great rookie tight end, Mark Andrews. They had John Brown, who was amazing with Joe Flacco, and then completely, <clears throat> when Lamar Jackson went in, John Brown's a great wide receiver, no doubt about that. But behind him, they had nothing for Lamar Jackson to throw to. So this offseason, what did the Ravens do? They invested in speed, and they invested in speed, and they invested in speed, and speed, and speed, and speed. And this shit was a drug. These motherfuckers would have OD'd by the fourth round of the NFL draft this year. Marquise Hollywood Brown from Oklahoma in the first round, the first wide receiver off the board. He didn't get to run at the combine, but every rumor report you've heard is that he runs probably in the low 4.3s, mid 4.3s, even his ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous speed. Then they draft Miles Boykin in the third round. This guy is 6'4", 220 pounds, 4.42 40-yard dash. That puts him in the 89th percentile for weight-adjusted speed score. A few picks later, more speed injections. Justin the God Hill. I've actually named like six people the God already this video. Everyone's an absolute fantasy God this year. Justice Hill, the fastest running back at the 2019 NFL Combine, ran a 4-4-0, 40-yard dash. So they added speed and speed, so much speed around Lamar Jackson. So teams can choose to game, to game plan around Lamar Jackson's speed, but that's going to come at the cost of giving up openings and field to the other playmakers on this field that have tons of speed. So the Ravens did a phenomenal job using play action last year, and I think that's what's going to benefit them this year, keeping defenses off balance and having to choose between who's moving around the who's moving around the field pre-snap, who's getting handoffs faked to them. It's an RPOs and shit like that, which works so great with Lamar Jackson. Now, the Ravens utilized play action on 42.9% of Jackson's throws last year. 42.9%. That was the highest rate among all NFL quarterbacks last year. It wasn't close. Jared Goff came in second with a full 7% lower rate of play action passes, 35.8%. Carson Wentz was the next highest rate at 32.1%, which was 10% lower than Lamar Jackson's. They're only two rankings apart from each other. On standard passing plays, non-play action, Lamar Jackson averaged just 5.9 yards per attempt, which is awful. On play action passes, Lamar Jackson's yard per attempt number skyrocketed up to 8.8. That's not a groundbreaking clip by any mean, right? 8.8 yards per attempt is not crazy, but the difference between his non-play action and his play action passes, those 2.9 yards per attempt, the biggest gap among any NFL quarterback last year. This offense, once fully implemented, once all these playmakers are in the offense, Lamar Jackson actually has the entire summer to prepare and get comfortable and familiar with everything that's going on in this offense, it's going to be a nightmare for uh, opposing OCs to game plan against. Something I absolutely cannot get my head around, though, the Ravens led the NFL in offensive plays run last year with 1,135. The Patriots ran the second most plays with 1,073. So that's not necessarily close. It's almost a full game of offensive snaps behind the Ravens. And what makes it jaw-dropping is the fact that the Ravens ran the single most run plays in the NFL last year with 547. They had the third highest rate, 48.2% of their offensive plays were runs. But it's crazy because you think about that, you lead the NFL in run plays, all that does is chew up clock and chew up clock and chew up clock. So how do they have time on the clock to run all of these plays? I don't know. Quick offense, fast paced, hurry up. That's what we're going to get from Lamar Jackson. More plays is always going to be a good thing when it comes to fantasy football. Obviously, they like to get Lamar throwing the ball a little bit more accurately and more often in 2019 or more accurately often in 2019 is what I should be saying. But they brought in Lamar to let him play out his style, right? His rushing mobile style wholeheartedly. What Lamar Jackson did on the ground last year cannot be understated for what is to come for his outlook for fantasy football. He literally made seven starts at the quarterback position in 2018. His rushing total 
in seven starts, 697 rushing yards, the 11th highest total for a quarterback in a season rushing yards of all time. 11th highest total in seven starts. Since the year 1991, only Mike Vick, Cam Newton, Russell Wilson, and RG3 have had bigger single season rushing totals at the quarterback position. Lamar did it in seven games, led the NFL in rushing attempts, 147 and rushing yards last year. Lamar Jackson was fantasy's quarterback five over those seven weeks that he was the starter, despite averaging 159 passing yards and 0.7 passing touchdowns per game. The rushing upside is fucking massive and it cannot be understated, guys. He is literally the perfect quarterback to draft in one quarterback league. In super flex, league, super flex leagues, he gets a lot more risky because he might play very poorly. It's very possible that the rushing upside does not fully account for how bad he will be passing the ball if he doesn't improve. I think he's going to improve. This is going to be a better offense, more weapons around him, another summer to acclimate himself to the NFL. I think he will improve. He also runs the ball a ton, so that means more hits, more likely to get injured at the quarterback position. So it's very possible you know, that the risks are higher associated with a guy like Lamar Jackson. So in a super flex, I would probably drop him down a little bit in my rankings. But at his current price, Price point of quarterback 16, 149th overall. You have to use almost no draft capital on him, and he will probably be on the majority of waiver wires following your fantasy football draft, which I think is a monster mistake, and I think I will be targeting him. I don't play in any one quarterback leagues anymore, but if I did, he would be a target of mine in, in probably every single one of them because you could just fucking drop him if something happens. I will leave you with this. If Lamar is on the field for the full 16 games, he is going to shatter, shatter Mike Vick's quarterback record of 1,039 rushing yards in a single season. So so Lamar Jackson, sleeper, quarterback number one. If you want all of my sleepers, they are available on bigdogsdraftguide.com. It is an extremely comprehensive, broken down, complete 2019 fantasy football draft guide for y'all. All of my rankings, standard, half PPR, full PPR, broken down by tiers positionally. It has my top sleepers, all of them by position. It has my top busts. It has my must draft players round by round by round by round one guy that i do not want to miss on in my draft in every single round 40 to 50 injury write-ups by dr jesse morse himself there's only probably 15 of them in there now he will be updating them throughout the summer and this entire thing will be updated throughout the summer with tons of exclusive content and and usable charts market share charts red zone receiving all of these fucking awesome tools you literally don't need to go anywhere else to prepare for your 2019 fantasy football season so go get all my sleepers bigdogsdraftguide.com it launched july 1st but is updated throughout the entire summer let's move on to sleeper number two kirk cousins of the minnesota vikings current adp quarterback 21 overall 174 I typically, you know, never advocate drafting a quarterback in one QB leagues based on their floor. But at quarterback 20, Kirk Cousin, his blend of floor and upside, I think, is wild based on his late availability. And based on what we've already seen, it's not like we're projecting something from Kirk. We've seen him do this for like three or four years in a row now. So we almost know exactly what we're getting out of him. He spent the three seasons prior in Washington as their starting quarterback averaged 4,369 passing yards a season and 28 passing touchdowns with way worse weapons than he has in Minnesota right now. He's literally coming off of a career high 30 touchdown campaign in 2018. And he's again, surrounded by arguably the best supporting cast in his career. Adam Thielen, Stefan Diggs, a healthy, excellent pass catching back in Dalvin Cook, a newly extended Kyle Rudolph and a second round rookie stud athlete at the tight end position in Irv Smith, who I think is going to act as like their third seam stretching weapon in this offense behind this elite wide receiver duo. Like, are we worried about this offense being more run heavy with uh, Kevin Stavansky at the helm calling the plays as a, as a full-time OC this year? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a very popular narrative and a storyline, but we've also seen Kirk rake in fantasy points despite much lower passing volume than he had in 2018, right? Like, listen to these numbers. 2015, he was quarterback nine on 540 pass attempts. In 2017, he was the quarterback four in fantasy on 543 pass attempts. Those totals, pass attempt totals, would not have cracked the top 12 in 2018. So he has proven to play well at the quarterback position, low volume, high fantasy production before in his career. So even if he takes a step back from what he saw last year in terms of total pass attempts, we've seen him be a top nine and a top four fantasy quarterback without that crazy, crazy, crazy volume. He's proven to play well with that. Despite the whole run-heavy narrative that we get from Minnesota this year, the argument is absolutely made on realistic rounds, and it's something that I've made, uh, I made early on in the offseason, something that I notice when you look at what happened with this offense when Kevin Stefanski took over as the OC, because we have a three-game sample size, 
But first off, we're also looking at literally a three game sample size. There are so many things that you could skew and twist that have to do with a three game sample size. If one of those games happened to have been a blowout, that's going to skew it. If one of those games that they were trailing by 21 points, guess what? The past 10 totals are going to be wildly higher. And those numbers that you're looking at in terms of like play percentage of runs versus passes over that three game sample size is going to be so skewed. And that's why you need to really, really take those things with a grain of salt when you're looking at small sample sizes from that. And lastly, like just look at the amount of money that this team has tied up into their passing game right now. Kirk got 84 fucking million dollars guaranteed. 28 million dollars in 2019. Feeling 14 million dollars in 2019. Stefan Diggs, 13 million dollars in 2019. Do you think they're going to waste $55 million on handoffs and run blocking on the outside? I mean, we've seen dumber things happen on an NFL field by coaches in the NFL who are dumb. I feel like those numbers suggest that we will not see it. So I'm in on Kirk Cousins. I think I really like him as a quarterback two in super flex leagues. Because again, when you're in a quarterback two league, or two quarterback league or super flex league, quarterbacks become a little bit more risky because you can't find them off the waiver wire. If you take Lamar Jackson as your quarterback two, yes, he's got that great upside and he could possibly be a league winner for you. But at the same time, if he busts, you can't just drop him and pick up a Mitch Trubisky or a Josh Allen because those guys are owned already. So I would argue that Kirk Cousins has more value in a super flex or quarterback two league because his floor is uh, a lot safer than a lot of people imagine. At quarterback 21, I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if he puts up very similar numbers to everyone going from quarterback almost seven up to or seven all the way up to 21 at this point. So I think he's a tremendous value at this point. So let's switch gears and talk about some pass catchers, specifically at the tight end position. We're going to start off with a rookie tight end. TJ Hawkinson of the Detroit Lions, currently the 21st tight end off the board, overall 146. I'm literally fine having Hawkinson in my lineup as my tight end one in a 12-team league. He is one of the top all-around tight end prospects that we've seen enter the NFL over the last half decade. He could do anything asked of him at the position, right? He could fly by linebackers. He could run crisp routes. He could pancake people on the goal line if you need to run the ball up the middle and score touchdowns, which I imagine we're going to see a lot of Carrion Johnson doing this year. And the Lions plan to use him accordingly on all three downs immediately. You know, you just look at the profile. He's got the size to play on all three downs. 6'5", 251, 4740 puts him in the 74th percentile for weight adjusted speed score. He's there on burst. He's there on agility. He's there on the catch radius. College dominator in the 74th percentile. So you have the production. You have the size. You have the speed. You have the athleticism. That's what we're looking for in a breakout tight end. And I know a, a lot of the fantasy hesitation is, one, the fact that he's a rookie, and that's obviously very reasonable. But I think you also need to put that into context. The reason tight ends don't necessarily translate immediately is because they can't. They don't have a three-down skill set. A lot of them either are undersized and can't be used near the red zone or some of them are not good enough, you know, in other assets of the game, whether it's blocking or this or that. So it takes them a long time to get onto the field for a significant portion of snaps. Hawkinson's going to be an every down player immediately. They, you, you pick him in the top eight, right? He was a number eight overall pick. Was he eight? Yeah, he was number eight overall pick. You pick him there to play immediately. They've already come out and said that, that he's going to be starting and playing on all three downs immediately. And that's what his skill set is there for. A lot of people talking about Jesse James. I know he got a big contract, but Jesse James is not a pass catcher. Jesse James is, I mean, he can catch the ball. I understand that, but he was one of the best blocking tight ends in the league. So what I think is one, this offensive line is good, right? This is a good pass blocking offensive line, despite what you might believe, because the offense kind of took a step backwards last year. A lot of injuries, a lot of things happened, but the offensive line was good. And Jesse James there, means that opens up more routes, I think, for TJ Hawkinson to run. He is a good pass blocker, a good run blocker, but I think that means that's going to open up middle of the field for him. And they don't have a pass catcher of consequence over the middle of the field. They have Marvin Jones. They have Kenny Galladay running on the outside, opening up the middle of the field, right? Golden Tate is gone, who's commanded, I don't know, 135 targets over the last... Um, I have the numbers down here. Yeah, Golden Tate, over the last four years, his, his four-year tenure in Detroit, 132 targets a season. That middle of the field is going to have a lot of volume available for a guy like TJ Hawkinson. And I think TJ Hawkinson is going to come in and, and command 80 to 85% of the snaps. And, and there are not a lot of guys at the tight end position that do that. And uh, you could probably guess the guys that do. It's those Kelsey's and those guys of the NFL. I know this this offense will be a little bit more run heavy, but Hawkinson, I think, has a really nice floor. Compared to what you're getting, I mean, he's going against tight end 21, which is fucking ridiculous, and he shouldn't be going that late. But if, if you're debating between like the tight end 10 to 15 range, what I think Hawkinson gives you 
is a really nice floor. I'm not sure we're, we're going to see the boom weeks where he'll go like seven for 110 and two touchdowns, like some of the top tier guys can give you. But I think he'll consistently give you like five for 44 and, and or like four for 56 or something like that and be a big part of this offense. And that could be very valuable because the way the tight end landscape is in fantasy, it's so hard to find consistency at the position, right? You're either getting like a top tier guy or you're just getting a guy who's inconsistent and some weeks giving you two points or three points or they're giving you 12 points. But I think Hawkinson will give you a solid seven and a half to eight fantasy points almost every week. And of course, if he scores a touchdown, that's going to boost up the 13 to 14 fantasy points. So if he finishes at the top six to eight tight end in fantasy, wouldn't be a surprise whatsoever. When I think about him, I don't see any objective glaring holes in his game. Matt Patricia is the head coach there. If you look at where he came from, it was New England, and they've been pretty good at producing a, a top-tier fantasy tight end with a similar skill set to a guy in TJ Hawkinson. His name is Robert Gronkowski. So uh, I really think he's going to try to mold him into that type of player. The other big piece of the puzzle here is Daryl Bevel coming over, and this is what makes you think that they're going to be very run-heavy in Detroit. Bevel has a well-documented history of skewing heavily towards the ground game. I understand that. No problem, because Hawkinson is one of the best run-blocking tight ends we've seen come out of college in quite some time, so he will be on the field all the time. But what I haven't heard mentioned is just how involved tight ends have historically been in the passing game for Daryl Bevel offenses. When you look at the target shares, and this is something that me and Noah broke down on, I think it was last Tuesday's video, he was the OC in Seattle for the last five years. He was uh, working anywhere in the NFL in 2018. But look at the tight end target shares, 25%, 23%, 27%, 19.5%, 21.5%, .5%, every single year above the NFL average except for 2014. And yes, a lot of those years were with Jimmy Graham. And I get that he was kind of in his prime, but I don't see them two as much different players. He won't hit peak Jimmy Graham because he's a rookie, of course, but I don't think he's very far off from what we'll see out of TJ Hawkinson eventually because Daryl Bevel clearly knows how to use his tight ends in his offense and will target the shit out of them if they are an upper tier tight end that Jimmy Graham had with Daryl Bevel there. 2017 season, Jimmy Graham led the NFL in red zone targets, red zone touchdowns, red zone target rate, targets inside the 10 yard line, was second in the entire NFL, but first among tight ends in touchdowns inside the 10-yard line, target rate inside the 10-yard line. Literally 40% of the throws went to Jimmy Graham inside the 10-yard line. And then just a side note, going back, my guy Bevel made Vasante Shanko a top five fantasy tight end during his run as OC in Minnesota 2018. 2008 and 2009. Again, you know, Hawkinson is just dra dr being drafted ridiculously low for, I think, the floor. Floor floor has to be considered when you're looking at season-long leagues when it comes to the tight end position because the tight end position is just so volatile. Most guys have a floor of like two catchers for 33 yards. We'll end the season with five touchdowns, so you're realistically only banking on one every three or four weeks. I think Hawkinson has a much higher floor than people are realizing. So I think, you know, if he finishes with 45 catches, 650 yards and six touchdowns, six to seven touchdowns, that line is absolutely not out of his range of outcomes. And that will make him a top 10, if not a higher fantasy option at the quarter, uh, tight end position. Again, they bring in Jesse James. They have a good offensive line. I think that means he's going to be running more routes this year. So I'm in at TJ Hawkinson uh, with a, a really, really, really high floor. Let's jump over to some of the low key guys I like in my draft guide at the tight end or quarterback position. Um, I'm not super high on them. I don't want to break them down too much in depth. I do kind of like them. I think Josh Allen, for the same reasons that we saw that I talked about with Lamar Jackson, I think Josh Allen has a nice upside. Obviously, we saw it with the rushing upside last year. It was incredible what he did down the stretch, just the rushing, the raw rushing numbers. I still think uh, him being a very underwhelming passer. Right, I named all the stats for Lamar Jackson, and I kept saying Josh Allen was the only starting quarterback that was ranked lower. He was really bad at throwing the ball. There's no denying that, but people are kind of blinded by the fact that he was so good rushing. What do we see happen there? You know, they brought in a lot of weapons. They brought in six new offensive linemen. Hopefully, like two of them could be actually good for them. Brought in running backs. They brought in wide receivers. They brought in tight ends. So they're also buying into Josh Allen and hopefully developing him. So I like Josh Allen. I would much rather take Lamar Jackson at this point than. Josh Allen. Um, but if you miss on Lamar and you want to take Josh Allen, I think they have similar upsides in a sense. Also like Sam Darnold. I, I want to peg him as, as like a breakout guy so badly, but I just have so much trouble doing that with Adam Gase there kind of steering the ships. And the fact that the offensive line is just still not good. Um, I love what the Jets did in adding Le'Veon Bell. I think he's going to be a great safety outlet for Darnold, but unfortunately they're going to be missing Chris Herndon, who I think is going to be a really nice player for them, but he's going to be out for the first 
four weeks of the season. Darnold was the youngest quarterback ever to start an NFL game last year. And he eventually progressed as a quarterback, right? He was kind of sloppy in the beginning of the year, started dealing with injuries, came on really strong at the end of the year. He had the highest QBR, highest quarterback rating in the month of December. And he was so young. So I like what they have here. I think we're probably one year away from you actually wanting to start Sam Darnold in your lineup. Like if you're in a one quarterback league, I can't imagine there are, can't imagine there aren't 12 quarterbacks that you would rather start over Sam Darnold in a given week. He's going to be hard to trust for a little while. A couple tight ends. I like Ian Thomas a lot. I'm pretty sure Greg Olson is either going to re-injure his foot or end up in the broadcasting booth by the end of the year. Greg Olson finally left the season for good with his foot. Over the last five weeks of the season, Ian Thomas was the tight end six in fantasy football. He caught at least four passes and topped 45 receiving yards and or touchdown in four of five games. Only Kittle, Ertz, Kelsey, Ingram, and Blake Jarwin were better in fantasy football over that span. Ian Thomas is also dealing with an injury, so we'll kind of have to see what's going on with him. He's questionable for the start of camp, but he's a name to keep an eye on. He might start slow. It might be a fantastic waiver wire pickup midway through the year. We've talked about OJ Howard, how he could be a trade high target later on in the year. Maybe Ian Thomas is the guy you pick up for him. Darren Waller of the Oakland Raiders, ridiculous athletic profile. 6'6", 255, ran a 4.46 40-yard dash, 99th percentile weight-adjusted speed score, a 91st percentile college dominator rating, albeit it was at the anemic Georgia Tech passing offense. And normally, I don't really care about coach speak at this time, especially for a guy who's never proven anything, but the Raiders will not stop talking about Darren Waller. So as far as I'm concerned, he needs to be on your radar. That is what I got for y'all today. Top sleepers, quarterbacks, tight ends. If you want the entire list of all the guys I got that we are sleeping on, that we need to stay woke about, you got to cop that at BigDogDraftGuide.com. If you enjoyed the video, if you enjoyed the big facts, this would be when you can hit that thumbs up button. If you're listening via podcast, I would love a rating and review. It takes two seconds to scroll down and hit that five star button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We are coming at you with the big facts. Every single day of the week, five videos a week. Bi-weekly, we will be going on Patreon to do a private live stream for my Patreons only where you can ask me any personal questions you might have. Patreon.com slash BDGE is where you can get some private, more exclusive content. Um, in, in, in season, I will be going privately live once a week. So go check me out there. Do all the bullshit that I just said before. BigDogsRapGuy.com. That is it for today. I love y'all. Thank you for sticking around and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.